Yeah, okay. All right, I'll just carry it around with you. <laughs> okay. Um, what I want to do, what time is it? About 27. Okay. What I want to do basically is show you how I implement open, structured, and literary hypertext kinds of texts into an English classroom setting. One of the reasons why I love working with Brett is that we get to come at things from two different angles and see what, that we're essentially doing similar or very similar kinds of work in two completely different departments. Um, so I'm going to show you some student examples, which is the, the main thing. But I want to start off explaining the classroom situation. Um, it is an upper level English class, uh, mostly juniors and seniors, and a couple occasional sophomore. Um, and it's, a, it's called a depth class here, or a breadth class, one of those. It's a general education class. I've only been here for a year, so I'm still trying to figure out what everything is called. Um, but students come into this class expecting it to be about writing. And they're like, they want it to be an advanced composition class where we write essays and more essays and research essays. And I'm like, no, that's not what I do. So <laughs> once I inform them that it's about interactive literary hypertexts or creative open spaced, open structured texts, they're very skeptical, uh, but I soon win them over. So, because <laughs> they realize, oh, I don't have to write a research paper. Sweet. Um, I draw a lot of theory from all of these different areas. There's two screens of it. But of course, there's a tons more coming from the education field, from instructional technology, from art, from music, from you name it. Uh, open text and open structured texts uh, can come from pretty much any field. The way that I apply these different kinds of theories in the classroom is talking about narrative structures, multiple reading paths, um, and especially, and I think most importantly in the English department, because people say, oh, you teach grammar, and I say, no, I teach web design, print publication, interactive multimedia texts, and they're like, in an English department? So I say, yes, I'm coming from a rhetorical standpoint where I get students to understand uh, audience purpose and context for non-written modes of communication. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the quirks about this class is we usually start with having them compose, I start with having them compose a literary hypertext, getting them to learn Dreamweaver or something like that, and constructing a very, very basic, uh, in about five weeks, interactive uh, piece of fiction or poetry. Uh, I would call that an open text. A lot of people might call the linear examples, the, the sequenced examples that I'm about to show you, closed text because there's no interactivity on the part of the reader, no physical interactivity, I should say. Uh, but I think they're open in the fact that students often um, are able to use the different modes of communication in ways that make the text open for them and the construction, the process of uh, design. So I want to first show you an example. And I have to go outside of the thing here. Let's see, because I've never used PowerPoint before, because <laughs> I hate it. Yes, thank you. Um, so I don't know how to insert objects. Oh, I need, it might be hard to see. This is one of the example texts that I showed them. This was not student created. So here, obviously, I need to turn this off because the crickets will keep going. Um, <laughs> we're talking about an interactive text there. How do I get back to where I am? What? Resume? Oh, oh. Duh. <laughs> okay, thank you for bearing with me. Um, so I use this as an example of an open text. It has interactive uh, navigational structures, plus it mixes the Eastern and Western in some nice ways that make students aware of the culturally sensitive issues, especially about the topic of 9-11. But then I give them a really easy assignment, because uh, in some cases, I've taught this class in a compressed week, and I can't teach them Flash in a week. So I figure what's the easiest way for me to do it through a uh, video where they can just string in images. And the requirements that I give them very basic and very open-ended assignment. So I'm going to show you two other examples. What's my time? Do I have time to show both? Oh, yeah. OK. The first one is, I think, a, shall we call it a good student example. 
where the student took, um, although it uses Enya. Yeah. Oh, what's going on? It's not showing. I have to do what? Shut off my display? It's not, no, that's just the... Okay. Sorry. Okay, now the bad student example really isn't worth my holding the laptop up for you to see it. Just know that it uses Dust in the Wind as the soundtrack. Um, so I will play that later if we have time. <laughs> Um, oh, it went back, yay. Okay, so the other one, the other example the student used, uh, instead of an original poem, uh, one that I forced him to use because he didn't understand the idea of a creative uh, piece of text. So uh, we can go back to that one later. The problem, and one of the big discussions in English composition studies and new media studies within English fields right now is how to assess these kinds of work uh, works. Um, there's a big rise in students producing this kind of work in English departments for various reasons, but you often show that to English teachers especially, and they're like, where's the writing? Well, there's writing in there because the students have to storyboard, they have to map things out, they have to write a proposal for me to explain what it is that they're going to produce, and have to get all that stuff approved, plus they have to script out, it, they have to write the poems or the, the fiction if they haven't yet done that. Um, but these are some of the questions, the larger issue questions that a group of teachers and I came up with um, based on that example that I just showed you um, in order to critique um, and assess this, these kinds of texts. But I think that the last bullet point, point was perhaps the most crucial for me. Does it help develop traditional forms of literacy? And of course that's when I come in and say, well, do we need to? Do we have to be doing that in every class that we teach? So when I talk to English teachers about this kind of work, of course, they always want to know, like I said, where's the writing? But then I give them this quote. <laughs> and I'm like, it doesn't always have to be about the writing. As y'all know, coming from other departments, it's about all sorts of communication and all sorts of interactivity and learning styles. So. All of my research is online, including the bad student example at this URL. <laughs> so you can go there and look at it later if you'd like. Thanks.